What's the difference between an opera and a musical? This deceptively simple question sent me on a surprising journey of discovery. So, what is the difference between operas and musicals? Isn't opera the one where they sing funny? The question invites snobbery and class warfare. From the Guardian's notes and queries come shots from opposing sides of the trenches. Snobbery, writes one person. Ears, says another. My favourite answer? When someone starts singing after being stabbed, it's an opera. So what actually is the difference? A quick type into Google gives you an opera is primarily sung, whereas in a musical, the songs are interspersed with passages of dialogue. That makes some sense. They do talk in musicals. Get your paws off me, you dirty ape! <gasps> he can talk! He, he can, can talk! He can talk! I can sing! Opera also has talky moments. You know, the bits where they try and shoehorn the plot between the big numbers. But these moments are sung. <laughs> these breaks between arias and choruses are known as restatives. From the Latin recitare, read out, to read aloud, to recite, and this is indeed a sung style of talking. In point of fact, this recitative style became rather out of fashion over the 19th century, with the two opera giants, Verdi in Italy and Wagner in Germany, both ending up writing operas that were recitativeless. So, we're good. Opera's entirely sung, and musicals, no. Hang on, is that Mozart? <laughs> Magic flute? How can you ask? You know my sorrow. <sighs> That's Seraglio. Two of Mozart's best operas, both filled with talking. Not restative, plain talking. And then how about the other side of the cultural fence? How about Les Miserables? Do I Joseph's Technicolor Dreamcoat. Or Hamilton. These are musicals with just music. No talking, just music. Okay, well, some try and square that circle by saying that musicals emphasise the text more than operas. As Richard Rogers of Rogers and Hammerstein fame said, in opera, you sing the music. But in musicals, you sing the words. Well, he would say that, being, you know, the one that writes the words. Anyway, this still doesn't come near to any kind of a working definition. Another attempt. An opera works with an orchestra, and a musical with a band. Okay, that sits a little better, but there are still exceptions. And look at Sweeney Todd, that has a rather classical sounding accompaniment. And that reinforces the peculiar clash of modern and old brilliantly. Now denying times is hard, sir. Even harder than the worst pies in London. Also, we're heading towards a circular, self-defining type of definition, a tautology. We might as well say, operas take place in opera houses, musicals in musical theatres. There are more definitions out there. Some suggest dance as a way of telling the difference. In opera, dancing occurs in separate interludes from the singing, normally with a troupe of ballet dancers. Whereas in musicals, there's more dance, and it's integrated into the singing, and what's more, all the main characters themselves are expected to dance. Well... Neat, but sounds suspect to me. I mean, if we're defining an art form whose main business is singing through dance, I don't think we're doing our defining job particularly well. It's probably worth giving some historical context to this and to think about how and where our art forms originated. Opera was almost certainly invented in Florence, the height of the Renaissance, right at the end of the 16th century. The supremely rich Medici family had been enjoying plays with musical interludes for years, but finally a bright spark named Jacobo Perry had the bright idea of making his entire play sung. And this is where the rest of the team was invented. Piro replaced the talking moments in his play, so the entire work, the opera, could now be sung. And over the course of the next century, opera exploded on the cultural scene, becoming the most popular art form in Europe and dominating concert halls and theatres for the next 300 years.
Beethoven was probably the first composer to become world famous without writing an opera. He eventually wrote Fidelio, but that was a struggle. So, operas are old, nearly 450 years old. Musicals are much more modern. It's a 20th century art form associated with the theatre part of New York, known as Broadway. Although Google will tell you the first musical was The Black Crook in 1866, musicals really started to spring off Broadway at the beginning of the 20th century. And there was a big contrast here. Actual Broadway's offerings in the early 20th century consisted mostly of light opera or operettas. They must have sounded, you know, so last century. What an opportunity, what an opportunity to pick the most charming dance candidate. What an opportunity, what an opportunity to pick the most charming dance Meanwhile, off-Broadway, those reviews were mixing sketches and songs and reviews and dance numbers and music. Stories were introduced to put coherence into these reviews. Shows which soon started to upgrade onto Broadway itself, before becoming Broadway. Showboat, which hits Broadway in 1927, is often considered the first proper Broadway musical. It came with a proper cast of characters, proper story and a load of proper songs, including, of course, Old Man River. Jerome Cohen, the musical genius, wrote the music for Showboat, and soon other New York-based musical geniuses like George Gershwin and Cole Porter were supplying a flood of incredible songs for this relatively new art form. Initially, these off-Broadway shows were in smaller theatres with smaller bands rather than large orchestras. And what's more, in the 20th century, with the rise of amplification and recording technology, it meant singers could be heard without needing to vibrate huge columns of air in huge lungs, as per your favourite 19th century diva. You know, the one who ain't over till she sings. Opera requires voice projection and a vibrato voice. Musicals don't. You see, vibrato and other similar singing techniques developed in opera as orchestration and choruses got bigger and bigger. Perry's first opera had a small accompanying band, but soon singers were competing against entire orchestras and whole choruses of singers, and that's a lot of noise. So, opera singers developed a number of techniques, including most obviously vibrato, to increase volume and prominence of the voice. We take a classic example, George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. This can be sung with a band and a normal singing style. But change the singing style and the band into an orchestra and suddenly you have an opera. There is talking in Porgy and Bess, but it's the white policemen that do it. You tell her if she don't come out here, I'll put her in a wagon and run her right in. White men don't just jump, they can't sing either. Now, let's drill down on this further, because this is where it gets interesting. If you perform Porgy and Bess with a band, but the singing is done opera vibrato style, I think most people will tell you they're hearing an opera. And if you use an orchestra for the backing, but the singing is normal musical style, I think most people will tell you it's a musical. So, it turns out, opera is the one where people sing in a funny voice after all. And do you want to know something even more surprising? We don't really know how Perry's original opera was sung, but it certainly wouldn't have been with all that vibrato and lung control you hear in modern opera. Daphne was performed with a band of just five musicians, which means opera, originally, way back, the way it was sung might actually have sounded more like musical singing. After all, fancy that. 